you can get maybe four actors in the booth and have them sing the song. Of course, it, it will probably need to go... Get them drunk. Yeah, get them drunk if they, if they want to. <laughs> Yago, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Finally, we made it happen. Yeah. <laughs> Excited to have you here. So when we were discussing like what this uh, episode will be about, there are a couple of things that we could have talked about because right now you're working as a communication specialist at Keywords. But we agree that we will focus this episode on audio localization, which is something that you've been doing for quite some time. Before we get into that, where exactly are you right now? So I'm in Madrid. I'm actually in the Keyword Studios office, which is based in what we call the dubbing mile here in Madrid. So so we have one uh, dubbing mile in Madrid. It's like this... There's several studios around, all dedicated to movies, video game dubbing. So it's kind of all all three, four of us are in the same street, kind of. Uh huh. Is it is it a term that's like uh, common in the industry? Because to me, it only relates to Green Mile, the movie. <laughs> dubbing Mile is the official term for something like that, or I don't know. Uh, so I would say this is a the recording hub would be the technical term or the dubbing hub in Madrid. Right. But uh, we call it the mile because there's also a fashion mile or, you know, golden mile and stuff like that. So we, you know, as a joke, we call it the dubbing mile because then we were all here. So you worked on non-audio projects before, right? Yeah. Related to video games, yes, I did work as a uh, localization tester. So not specifically... A PM or anything. So I went from being a lock tester to audio PM. Is is that how you got into localization? Yeah. 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 I was I was always kind of interested in joining the, the video game industry. And I think being a tester is one of the one of the ways you can get into the industry. So for anyone kind of, you know, thinking how can I do it, there's a lot of uh, Q and A and LQA uh, positions out there. You can you can use and maybe if you if you do well and you make your contacts, you can find your way into other spaces of the industry because uh, it's not too easy to get in uh, at least at, in some sectors or sections of the industry. But through Q and A and LQA, I think there's a high possibility you can get a, a job. Were you ever thinking of joining the side that? developed the games instead of being on the localization side? So here in Madrid or in Spain, we we do not have too much of a um, development um, structure or infrastructure. So the developers are always, you know, United States, UK, Japan, stuff like that. So, but we do have a very strong localization and QA uh, structure. So there's lots of companies doing lock and QA and stuff like that. So... Um, I think it depends geographically uh, where you live and if you're if if you're available to move and if you want to move to other countries, that's also something you kind of have to take into account when thinking what type of uh, job you're looking for in the video game industry, which is such a big thing. So localization is just a, sm- a, s- a small part of the process. Is that still something that's on your roadmap? Like, would you ever eventually want to work on the development process i mean i would never say no to to anything that sounds like a pretty interesting option i would say it's just that now for, for example what i'm doing at keywords it's a different uh, thing it's like a more strategic uh, position where we talk about what well, i deal with communication and marketing stuff like that so uh maybe if i go down that road you know development starts getting farther and farther away but um, would I ever want to? I'm definitely interested in how all that works. And I would definitely want to get to know firsthand how, how that happens. So, I mean, for sure, it would be very interesting. I don't know if I will ever get the chance. But, well, we'll see. You never know. Maybe I'll end up working at a developer rather than a, a provider or partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do like a marketing PR communication. Exactly. So, instead of uh, moving uh, jobs, I could 
have a different uh, position other elsewhere and then uh, like I'll be more in contact with you know the game development if you work at a studio or something like that or publisher for sure do you feel like very tied to Madrid and Spain or would you consider moving away no I'd say I'm I'm quite uh, I'm quite tight yeah I say I've been I have built my entire relations family friends hobby music band I have it's it's every everything's here so I would I would have a very hard time moving places but again I'm, I'm not close to anything it's just I would find it uh, quite complicated to just to pull it off and you know successfully moved elsewhere and have uh, that would be that would be complicated you mentioned before that like the the, the game studios are like centered in us uk maybe japan do you think like with covid they are more open to having people work remotely or is it still tied to one single location mm, no i would say like the entire world has changed and remote working has uh, been accelerated you know by by covid so it, it was a thing that uh, people said that companies said they had mm-hmm but it wasn't something they really had or that was really it was actually a reality that you could you could enjoy as a and as an employee in all in companies but i think covid has accelerated that and i've already i read a piece of news the other day and what square enix was just moving to remote working permanently so they they were going to completely uh delocalize everything so their offices and stuff like i mean surely you still need to have a physical structure uh somewhere but i think they were they were gonna just scale it all down and, and try something else you know have everyone working from home see how that works i think the possibilities to work not in the place where your company is based are gonna are gonna be bigger as time goes by yeah a lot more for sure mm-hmm. i do not i do not know how how it, how things are going to develop so i really i really don't know how much you could be working in madrid for a company a development company based in uh, london for example at Cures, we have uh, employees from all over the world and it's already uh, at some times where we kind of have a global meeting it's always hard to find the time spot between for example you know japan or uh, and los angeles because you know it might be 8, 8 p.m for some but it might be 6 a.m for others so it's complicated it's complicated when you were looking for the job in the industry was it purely because of your passion for games yeah i would say so yeah were, were you always thinking like i want to combine my passion with something that earns me money because I think that many many people are actually not scared, also scared of doing that, you know, because some people may think that like my passion will not earn me enough money. So they opt for a different career, which, you know, like a lawyer or doctor or accountant, but they're like bored, bored to that, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I, that that was exactly my case. I Maybe now is it's a bit clearer, but 20 years ago when I was in school, I didn't even know you could make money. Uh, there was there was an actual industry around video games. I kind of enjoyed them, but I didn't know there was such a big structure around them. So many job uh, options and stuff. So I think the job, uh, the, the video game industry still has to do that, that teaching work uh, through academics, schools and stuff. So they they we, we still have to become an option for kids uh, because they don't know. They don't know they could actually uh, do a thing they love, and that's going to be uh, a viable, a more than viable option, you know, to develop professionally. And I just think kids uh, don't know. I think kids these days know a lot more than than we did back in the day. But um, yeah, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in schools and universities, for sure. And was it personally for me? I studied journalism. Uh, you know. I've always loved communication, journalism, stuff like that. So uh, I studied journalism and 
I started working as a journalist, actually. But, you know, then the crisis uh, 2010 came, then journalism was hit pretty bad by that one. So, you know, there was all the transition from paper to digital. Companies didn't actually really know what the future of journalism would be. So it was um, it was a tense moment that they, they fired lots and lots of people. So I was one of those. I mean, I, I, would just, I just came in the... Uh, in the journalist industry. So it was very easy to, uh, you had to keep the, the big names so the, the smaller ones were, were fired. And then I, I thought, I mean, what's the rest of the things I love? I love uh, communication, uh, journalism, I love video games, and I love music. So, I mean, uh, number, I failed number one, let's try number two. <laughs> it was as easy as that. I try, I, I searched for video game companies that were based in Madrid. And I found uh, Electronic Arts had a uh, an office here in Madrid. It was it's a uh, very focused on LQA and stuff like that. So I applied. I got a, a temporary job there. Started working as a lot LQA tester, and uh, I'm here now. So it's been some years working on it, but um, it paid off. Yeah. Well, another passion that you mentioned is music. So does does your passion to music somehow? translate into you working as an audio pm or is that more mostly about like the typical project management as as i know it maybe from translation and localization project and there's not much like creativity going on mm, yeah i would say there's not too much of a uh, creativity so enjoying music i mean there's aspects you kind of uh kind of touch maybe i because of my past or, or I, because I've recorded uh, albums with bands and stuff like that, I, do, I know how the recording process uh, works. You know, I know what a plugin is. I know how different um, workstations work. So kind of just by, just because I've, I've been in touch with them. And maybe that has helped me kind of be more familiar with some of the tools you use. But I, I'd say that's as far as it goes. How did the opportunity came for you? You mean of being an audio PM? Yeah. I I think I my bosses at EA were happy with uh, what I with the, the work I I did there for 2 years. So the problem with LQA and and all these types of jobs is you kind of um it's not super stable, mm -hmm. so uh, it goes on a project basis, and um, well, at least most of the the, the jobs like this. Uh, so I had the I had the keywords acquired three studios in Spain. And they merged them all together to create the actual keywords Spain keyword studios Spain. So that opportunity came precisely when I was. Uh, going to be projectless as an QA tester at, at, at EA. And some of the people at EA were going to, were moving to keywords mm -hmm. because this, this big opportunity showed up. So, and my boss has say, said, Hey, this, this opportunity is here. Do you want to try out and have an interview? And it was, it, I came into audio because there was a, a vacancy because they needed someone in audio. Right. Maybe if they had needed someone in lock, like in text uh, translation, I would have ended up there. But it was all a matter of, of, you know, how things went. How do you remember your first days as a project manager? Was it something completely different for you? Because LQA test it's kind of like, like people tell you like what to do, right? They, they tell you exactly like test it this way. But when you're a project manager, you get to expand and you're basically the person in charge of everything. One of the most uh, curious things I would say was like being a, a, a QA tester or a LQA tester, you get to see the end product and you get to uh, be in touch with the end product much, so much more than any production uh, PM or anything. So you get to see the game and you be, you, you get to be in touch with the game. And then when, when I became a PM, it's like, uh, there's no game. You're, you're dealing with assets, you're dealing with audio, you're dealing with scripts and Excel files, but the game is nowhere to be seen. 
unless you kind of see uh, color cinematics or anything. So that was like a, a big shock. I say, I'm, I'm dealing with something I'm not really in touch with anymore. So that was a that was a big step. But uh, you also get to see the like the other side. So maybe when you're an LQA tester, uh, you kind of freak out, saying, "How how are uh, these types of errors made? So why are these errors in the game?" So you kind of uh, don't understand how complex the whole process is and how things that seem obvious at first glance, then you, you, you think about them as like, okay, I understand that this has been a mistake done in this step and it hasn't been detected because of these other reasons. So I think that the, the higher you move on the ladder, you zoom out and you see a bigger picture. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, now as, um, as a communication specialist, I'm kind of seeing more of what uh, there's apart from localization because I'm in contact with the art service line or with the uh, you know QA service line or with the development, music, whatever. We, like yours does a lot of things. So you get to see that there's a lot more and you can, and, and then you kind of get to understand where each step of the process goes. And then you understand that localization is last in the uh, process. So it's kind of the last step the last production, I, I'm say, I would say, is the the last truly uh, production step. So that's that's where it came. So there's a lot of things, and you have to understand that being in the last in the process, not uh, not the last in importance uh, by any means, but I said last in the in the, the schedule. You uh, you understand why developers do things they do. So if shit happens before, like you're the one who gets to. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, so as localization, one of the things you have to be aware of, it, even as an LQA tester, is that you're going to see, uh, you're going to be the last eyes on the product. Mostly, some of the last pair of eyes on the product. So it's always good to to be aware uh, of everything because you can end up improving the actual end product or the original uh, product, even just by being aware of, uh, of your localization uh, space. Okay, so let's talk about the audio localization. Sure. My experience here is very limited, so that's why I'm very curious. <laughs> I think this will be kind of like an introduction to audio localization. The only thing that I worked on, which involved like some voiceover, was when I was working on Autodesk projects. And you know, when they were doing their annual releases of all their products, like AutoCAD and all those million products that they have, they would do like videos, like getting started, or these are the new features, and they would localize the, the audio as well. So my first question is, because uh, when we talk about audio, maybe you can speak for games, or maybe you can even speak like in audio localization in general, what actually belongs to audio localization besides of voiceover okay so uh, it kind of uh is an ongoing discussion you know because audio localization in terms of audio when audio development ends and when audio localization starts is a bit of a blurry line um of course if you're adapting something you're gonna know it's uh, localization, and if you're creating something, it's a uh, development. But maybe you're creating some assets for localization, because maybe, for example, given a, a character that has a you know strong uh, voice effect, or you have to mix some effects in the in the cinematic, for example, most of the times you're giving the assets uh, to work with. But the mix is on your own. So the final mix is kind of uh, a thing you're doing. So you're giving assets, but you're not really just adapting them. You're creating a mix on your kind of own. So the lines are blurry. I would say, of course, dubbing is a clear uh, audio localization. But then you have uh, you know, post-production. For example, uh, post-production is also part of the localization process, mixing uh, QA of the audio files 
I would say that's still localization. But as 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 deeper you go within the uh, audio engineer role, so what those guys do, the lines get a little bit blurry because they may be uh, creating some stuff uh, on their own to uh, to add to the localized product. But you know, it has to be very similar to the original. Would you ever? localize let's say sound effects or music for any game or does it always stick to the original no no it depends on the developer but um you there's definitely some developers and publishers that like everything to be localized like absolutely everything and that's a business uh strategy so there's some developers that will go full on localized and some others will, will don't but yeah, we've done we've uh, we've done quite a bit of songs actually as well. Really? Yeah, and it's a, a pretty interesting process, I would say. It's even more different than just a normal audio localization because then you're you're gonna have a director, you're gonna have a voice director that's gonna be the pe- the the person in charge of you know the, the the game knowledge and stuff like that. But then you're gonna have like an actual music director. It's going to be with the, the talents, uh, you know, directing like, uh, yeah, that was a bit off tune, uh, you know, sing it, the staccato or just, you know, so it, like the actual music stuff. So they're going to read the this music sheet and they're going to have to adapt the script because then you have words you have to put in in, in tune. And so the localized, the, the translators really can localize a, a song script. Mm. But then you have to make it fit the actual song structure. Right. And that's very complicated. Right. Wow, that's like the next level. Yeah, that's that's one of the hardest things to do is localizing songs. Oh. I'm still like trying to grasp this idea. Like, can you give us an example? Like, not specific because you don't want to name the projects or the clients. But like, just so that I can imagine like on some some game that people know like where would you actually want to localize a song and where would it make sense from the business perspective to actually go do it think about a a marketing video where you have like the christmas uh, special uh, dlc or whatever and then that's accompanied by a youtube video with a song and some developers and some publishers would localize that song Maybe you're going to see that song as uh, when you open up the game, some stuff like that. Maybe it's in-game, maybe it's a cinematic you're going to see in-game. Uh, I'd say songs are mostly uh, off-game, like outside the game, just marketing stuff. But, uh, you know, there's also maybe a you, you go inside a bar within the, the game, you go inside a, a bar a canteen or something like that and the people are singing of course you're not gonna have the music director there that's not uh, such a special thing that needs uh, direction musically so they can just if that's a tavern it's just for drunk guys then it can be done with the normal structure we have <laughs> yeah yeah speaking of drunk guys that i immediately thought of uh, assassin's creed black flag I think I didn't play that game, but I when I read the reviews, I think many people were uh, saying that the songs that you get when you're, uh, you know, like sailing with your with your crew, that those songs are like really good, and it's like it has like that atmosphere of like drunk pirates, you know, sailing and saying things. So those would be, I mean, if the game's localized, I'm I'm sure those were localized as well. Then again, there's no instruments and there's no. Uh, you can do that like in a normal localization process. You can get maybe four actors in the booth and have them sing the song. Of course, it, it will probably need to go... Get them drunk. Yeah, get them drunk if they if they want to. <laughs> uh, and of course, that song would need to go through adaptation. And because, again, the translators can, you know, without context, without seeing the game, they may know that's a song. But then uh, they wouldn't know like the actual metrics or rhythm of the song because they're not going to be able to listen to it. So one of the jobs of the uh, artistic director in the studio is 
uh, going through the script and adapting it. And if it's a song, he's going to have to adapt the syllables and maybe change the text a little bit so it kind of fits. So that's how songs are complicated. So you are working specifically as an audio PM. But in my case, the example that I share with you, I was basically a project manager for the whole product localization where the videos plus the voiceover was just part of it. So my question was, are there actually only projects where the client only wants you to do, to do audio localization? And if so, do you somehow collaborate with the rest of the people who are localizing the non-audio assets? You mean the text assets? Yeah, like or like the whole game. I haven't seen any... Usually, if a client wants audio localization, they will uh, also give you the text. But that's not always the case. So maybe uh, there's clients, if I, and I've seen clients that they do their own translation. Mm -hmm. But since you're going to need, need uh, native speakers, uh, so audio localization is very uh, local. So you need to have like the, the, the local structure because you need the natives and you need the, the, the network. So uh, that's something you only get by being there. So some clients might, cr might create their own uh, translations and then just hand you uh, the audio localization, just the audio localization. And I've seen that. Do you get in contact with um, the other? Well, it, it goes on a case by case, uh, you know, type, type of thing, I guess, because it all, it all kind of boils down to how much freedom do you have to change the text? Because if you're free, if the client has given you a very strict script and you cannot change it, then you're going to have some issues because you're always going to have to tell them before you change something. And, and that makes everything more complicated. If the client has a trust uh, in your work, in your studio, they usually give you a lot of freedom to adapt. And that always is super helpful because you're not, you're not always needing to kind of contact them for every minor change. And what we usually do, if, if this is the case, because we have uh, clients uh, which are uh, both, some clients are more strict, and they want the, the script just as we received it. And others are give you a lot of leeway so they don't have a problem with you changing anything. And the, in, the, in either case, what we do if we change a phrase or a sentence or a file is we record an alternative version. Mm -hmm. so imagine that a file, we feel it was not translated properly because of lack of context or whatever. So you change it. But you always record an alternative version with the, with the text that was in the script. Even if it doesn't make sense and you know it's not going to be used, you're always never 100% sure. So you always record an alternative. And then what clients may, be, may ask of you is, send me the alternatives. And I will choose and I will see uh, what's up. What's up? Yeah. Most of the times we end up having a lot of alternatives and that, that's... That's one of the hardest parts of uh, tracking uh, in audio localization, I would say. It's just having control over alternative assets, what you've recorded from the original script, what you've adapted, what's an alternative, what's in the alternative. Because in the end, maybe you're going to have a file that says rogue01 person for attack uh, dot whatever. So what's in that file? You don't know. You have to go to the script. Well, maybe you can play it, but you're not going to be playing thousands of files. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're going to have to go to the script and say, let, let me check. Because they, if something's wrong with that audio, and it's a, they say the client says, hey, this audio is bad. Why is it saying this and not what's in the script? You have to go to the script. because, And those, those, is, those are, I would say, like the, the hardest parts of audio localization. You're handling such a vast amount of assets, like actual files, and one by one, they can add up to thousands uh, for a single game, mm -hmm. which is a pretty, pretty common thousands. I've, I've seen, I've seen big, big numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So we already talked about some of the specifics of the process, like some, some details, but I think it would be great if for people like me who don't know anything about audio localization, we somehow like briefly 
very generically describe the process. Sure. So I thought, you know, I shared with you that, you know, one of the the, the games that I've played and where the voiceovers were super, uh, super appreciated was Overwatch. So on that case, if we can say like, okay, I'm Blizzard and I create the, the audio in English, and then I contact keywords, what happens then? So what would happen in that case, well, as I said, it, it kind of goes on a client uh, by client basis, but uh, the usual process for any client would be to understand first how we're going to work, you know, that, for example, this, uh, do you want alternatives? Uh, can we have freedom to change stuff? Do we have freedom to cast? Stuff like that. So the actual process would be first, imagine it's an ongoing project. You already uh, know the client. It's not something super new. And all this is kind of laid out already. So uh, there someone, some, client is uh, bringing a new IP. So they want to, their new characters, new everything. They send you the familiarization. So you're familiar with that, uh, those types of things. They, well, they send you information about the game, just so you know. And the, the, the important thing when um, for the audio localization side would be to understand who the characters are and start maybe thinking about suitable voices because you have to make a casting. And the way casting goes is that you either have like a database casting, that's how what it's usually called, or a live casting. So a live casting would be you get information from a character, maybe even you get a voice sample, which is usually what would you get, voice samples of the actual character already. But maybe at some point, uh, the, the development is, uh, or, or the character couldn't come record some uh, samples. So you have to work with only a description and a picture of the character and stuff like that. So you would cast, uh, you would find from our, our records of uh, talents, you would find the most suitable, in your opinion, actors or actresses for that role. They would actually record pieces of the actual script you're given by the client. And then you send it to the client and they would choose maybe it's three, four, five options. So they would be in character so that the talent would be already playing the character. So that would be a live casting, a database casting, which is much more, is much more quick. We have database samples of all the talents we work with. So we have a pool of uh, 200 plus 300 plus uh, talents here in Madrid. So we have specific samples one acting as a soldier, one acting as a monster, you know, other with a more, um, you know, a type of fairy voice, whatever. So we have samples, like kind of archetype samples for each of one of them. And then we would, uh, they say, okay, I have this five new characters, send me the samples. We would choose the most suitable options for that character, three, or depending on what the clients want, three is the usual number options. You send them to them with uh, voice samples. And then they choose from that. So from both the live casting and the database casting, the client is the one who ends up, uh, ends up choosing which voice they want. But you kind of filter out. You already, you already send them three, four, five options to choose from, not 100 to 200. Right. Who is the person on the localization side who shortlists these three people that you then push to the client? Is it the PM or someone else? No, it usually is the artistic director. So uh, that's the person who's going to be in the booth with the cat with the talents. So the, they are the ones to, who know the talents more, of course, because uh, you, as a PM, you don't really have that much of a contact with talent. Right. So they are the ones who know their voice characteristics, their uh, availability. Uh, you know, maybe if, if it's a character that shouts a lot maybe it's a soldier who's shouting a captain you know it's going grenade let's go let's move move you know it's a person who shouts a lot you're gonna want to have talents that can do that without breaking their voice and some talents can do that and others can't and usapm wouldn't have that knowledge but the artistic director who's worked with them closely uh, would for sure just to be sure so 
you as a PM, you receive the request, right? But then you reach out to the artistic director and he does this magic. Yeah, exactly. So you, you prepare everything and you say, you give them the information they need, you structure the samples because maybe the client sends you uh, in a way that's not very uh, easy to handle. So your work is to put them put that information in a digestible form for the audio director. And then maybe at some point, the, even the the client is going to ask for a specific talent that has happened and especially when they are like vip talents or stuff like that they ask for i want my main character to be this uh, talent okay we'll do that for you we'll, we'll get in contact with the talent or whatever so that's kind of the initial part is uh, casting once you have the cast and the cast is kind of all it's ever evolving so it's not just like i haven't seen a cast that's uh, closed from the get-go so usually you cast the main characters and you keep casting as the project kind of goes on because there's lots of characters. And maybe you can have a um, structure where a single voice is a voice, a single talent is voicing three or four char different characters throughout the game, like minor characters. Of course, the main characters are just going to have one voice because it would then be too obvious. But then if you have like civilian two, and mercenary three and four, and then those guys you can they can be voiced by the same character, and that character, that talent's gonna modulate the voice a little bit, so it, it doesn't sound as the same guy, but it's the same talent. So also clients are wanting to uh, save costs because then uh, you kind of can uh, kind of pile up booking times because some characters really have very very little. Uh, lines. So if they have three lines, and you can have to pay half an hour, because that's how things work. You pay at least either half an hour or a first hour. If it's for one line or uh, 20 lines or 100 lines, the first half an hour or an hour, depending on the country, is paid as a block, so you cannot uh, divide it. So then you, you want to kind of uh, be cost efficient and say, if you're coming to record one line, one line for this guy, you just kind of record this other 150 lights for this other guy. We'll make an entire hour. Yeah, we have the same with, with translations. Uh, translators typically complain a lot if you just send them like five or ten words. You know, especially with like software now that it's agile and the client just, you know, updates like a few strings and hey, please translate this. And then translators are like either not happy or they're charging you minimum charge, which is not good. So like in your case, you want to like bundle it with some more work. Exactly. Yeah. One thing that I was also curious about, because when we were saying that on the localization side, the artistic director picks the three candidates for each language. So, but then you submit it to the client and who on the client side actually decides which talent to pick if it's different languages. Do they also have their artistic director? And can that person one actually, can one person actually decide about let's say eight ten different languages or do you need native people to make the decision it depends on the localization effort uh, and culture on the client side so there are clients that are going to have a big big localization culture and they're going to have uh, they're usually called specialist uh, spanish specialist the german specialist or right. the uh, matter subject or whatever that they have several names depending on the client but there's usually specialists for each language and they are the ones who are going to be on top of the localization from the client side. But I've seen I've seen clients that not, don't do too much of a localization or don't have that big of a localization culture. So they would just have one person taking a look at them all. But if it's just one person, you usually don't see one person dealing with eight languages. Because if it's just one person, it means the client doesn't really localize that much. So maybe we're talking about two or three languages. Although I've seen, I do remember one client that has just one person because they're doing localization just now. They're beginning to do it uh, because of the game uh, nature, the game's nature. And they're doing, starting to do localization now, but uh, they just have like one person dedicated to it. So they chose all languages. And at some point, these people can say, hey, studio, choose whoever you, you think fits best. 
because I'm not going to be as knowledgeable as you guys. So uh, we do get a lot of those uh, clients with, who don't have like that much of a localization culture. Just let us do the choosing for them, which is also very helpful at some point. Okay. Enough of my questions. <laughs> Maybe now we can go back to the process. So we have the we have the cast. So after casting, I would say then there's adaptation. You get the script and it has to go through adaptation. To speak about adaptation, you have to think about how games are recorded or dubbed. When an original uh, is recorded, uh, maybe the English files for a specific game, they may have some constraints in terms of timing, but they usually just do whatever whatever comes up. But when you localize, you have a lot of constraints that kind of tie you in, in different ways. So, for example, you could have um, files that need to be at the same length as the original file. Think about a conversation or a, a game engine that plays files uh, just one after the other finishes. Just after one. It plays one file just because the other one has ended, not because it kind of recognizes the, the type of file it's playing. It's just a series of files, and it's, uh, it's just meant to play one after the other. So in order to play out as a conversation and play out with the facial animations of the characters and what you're seeing on screen, you actually have to time those files so they are the same length as the English, and everything's going to play out in the same way as the original did. So those would be like a hard constraint files. You also have no constraint files. They, they, they are given several numbers, VO files, wild files. They, they, they got, depending on the company, they got different length names. But those are files that really don't matter. Um, those are mostly on the multiplayer side. Multiplayer side is, is uh, they have lots of files, but uh, they're usually not uh, constrained. I think about you know a battle, uh, a, a war game where lots of sh soldiers are just uh, shouting stuff at each other. It doesn't really need to play out in a certain way. So if you throw a grenade, the game engine is going to just throw, uh, it's going to play that grenade sound or that throwing a grenade sound. But it doesn't really need to play out in a conversational way. So. You could have that sound and maybe other could be listening to other sounds and that's just a uh, place when it has to play. So those are wild. It doesn't matter if the original file was one second long and you record the three second long file. So that's okay. Then you have like other situations where you want the files to be kind of uh, similar, but you don't want uh, a hard constraint. And why would the reason why would you wouldn't want a hard constraint is because the harder the constraint, the longer it takes to record. So of course, it, for the talent, it's going to be a lot easier to record files that have no constraint. So they can go like one after the other, just uh, making sure the acting uh, projection is okay. But when you start to put constraints in the mix, uh, productivity goes down. And productivity going going down means you're gonna have, have the talent more time in the booth, so it's gonna cost more money. You need to have all constraints clear to kind of make a make make the recording work. So after casting, how it would play out is that you go into adaptation. So, for example, you get a script and it's been translated by a third party or even your 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 own translators, but. Maybe the translators have the constraint information, but maybe they don't. So maybe they know that this file is a hard constraint, so it has to be the same length, but maybe they don't. And if they don't, maybe they, they just translate it normally and they would go uh, you know, out of bounds. They would translate it too long. So then the artistic director would need to go through the entire script that's going to be recorded and adapt it. That's why you kind of need to give them a very clear picture of which uh, files have constraints and what those constraints are. As I mentioned, there's a you know, wild, maybe a 10% constraint, 20% constraint. Uh, you can go up longer, 20, 
we also have like a strict constraint, which is you cannot go uh, longer than this. And well, not even longer, not even shorter. It has to be the exact same uh, length. And then you have sound sync, what we call sound sync uh, constraint, which is it cannot be longer, but within the file, you also have to take into account uh, internal pauses. Uh, so if the character stops talking, you have to stop talking. So the file, if you put a, a sound sync file, an original sound sync file, an original and a localized sound sync file, they would very, very look pretty similar. That's what they need to look like. And then the final constraint would be uh, lip sync, which is kind of the way uh, movies and TV series and shows and whatever uh, are localized. You're seeing the character already moving its mouth and you're nailing it to the character's mouth. But that just goes for cinematics, I would say. And most of the cinematics are too early in development by the time it gets to localization. So I'm, I'm not, I haven't seen too much of cinematics like being uh, fleshed out uh, or you know already in a final stage. So mostly you would get a reference, a video reference where you get the models they're kind of moving a little bit stiff. Uh, so mouths are not moving and stuff like that. Maybe they don't have the textures on uh, still. So, but it kind of gives you an idea on the, uh, the the context and when you know, for example, you're going to have a, a mouth on uh, on site on the screen, and then if you have a mouth on screen, you're going to want to perfectly match the English to the localized language because if not, it's gonna it's gonna be weird. But then if the character is looking other way or you're not seeing his mouth then maybe you can that's just how it, it's done in movies and stuff like that so after the casting i would say adaptation that's a crucial step and it it does take a while mm -hmm. but it really pays off in a sense that right. you can really make a recording go so much quicker if you take the time to adapt if you're going to the booth without going through adaptation maybe it goes well, but maybe you're going to be adapting with the talent inside the booth and you're going to lose money because of that. Yeah. When we had our intercall, I was asking you if there's something like internationalization happening for audio localization and you wanted an example. I think this would be sort of an example because from what you're telling me, I understand that adaptation is not like a standard process. Like it can help a lot, but maybe some clients, they don't know about it and they don't want to invest into it. Maybe they see just, okay, I'll give you the script, go record it, and that's it, right? So is it really at that stage, like within the industry, that adaptation is only like for the advanced companies and you have to really pitch the idea to the clients to actually pay for it? Or do you guys decide that as the, as the vendor? It's usually uh, budgeted. So it's time you budget. Uh, and, if it does, and if it's not budgeted, that's in taking a specific field in the budget saying that we're going to take so much on adaptation, then you you have to yourself when you're quoting, when you're budgeting, you have to take that into account and maybe put it inside the pre-production uh, concept or anything. So it's kind of a given. I think most people understand that there's time uh, you need to do for these types of things. So yeah, I would say, I would say clients really are... Uh, already bought in you don't have to tell them adaptation is necessary right right good and my second question was uh when you as a pm schedule the whole project which includes the adaptation and you were talking about the different constraints and how that affects productivity do you guys have something like a standard let's say productivity metrics or expectations like for example for translations like typically around 2000 words per day a translator can do so how is it with adaptation so we have our own metrics. I can uh, I can say the numbers, uh, but uh, yeah, we have our own metrics. Uh, we know, well, out of experience, out, out of uh, data and statistics, we know how much time you win by adapting and how much time it takes to adapt, depending also on the constraint. Because it's not the same as uh, adapting uh, a hard constraint or a strict time constraint file 
as a cinematic uh, sound sync constraint. Uh, for cinematics or sound sync, you're gonna have, you're gonna want to maybe even add gestures in the script, so breaths and stuff like that. Uh, the artistic director would add that into the actual script, and uh, so when they're going in the booth. They already know, okay, I'm going to record this uh, breath here. I'm going to do this and that. Uh, all that's taken out after uh, all those notes are maybe created in a different column in the Excel file or whatever. But uh, it, it, that helps a lot. And it, of course, it depends on the type of uh, constraint, the metrics. But yeah, we do have metrics on adaptation on how much the talent takes to record 100 files in each different constraint. Mm hmm you mentioned excel file so where where exactly does the adaptation happen is it really just like word document excel or is there any some sophisticated file format for these things no excel is the king uh, i'd say yeah excel is king for everything uh, especially when you're dealing with thousands of lines uh, on a single script we have to work in excel so each studio would do uh things differently mm -hmm. So uh, we have our own tools and we have our own ways of uh, cr creating uh, specific formats on, uh, on an Excel file so it's digestible or easier to read on our side. Mm -hmm. So we have tools that maybe macros and stuff that kind of uh, help us out. So it would maybe create a, a column specifically for adaptation uh, that would maybe then uh, compare the original column with the adaptated column and highlight a difference if there is one, stuff like that. So we have our own tools that do the, those types of things and make life uh, a lot easier, I would say, yeah. But yeah, Excel is, Excel is uh, the way we record stuff. Wait, one thing that I just thought of right now, like when you mentioned that you compare these two things, so is the adaptation happening, like let's say the original is English script, do you adapt the English first into another English, which is, let's say, better for localization? Or when you say adaptation, we just translate the script? Yeah, adaptation is just a uh, translated script. Yeah. yeah. Of course, English uh, reference has to be there because you're going to want to know what, what the original says, but you're, uh, you're looking at the uh, translated text most. Yeah. Okay. So going back to our imaginary project, yes. <laughs> and then after that, uh, you go, you, you get, you have your casting, you've gone through adaptation, you schedule the talents. Uh, given the metrics we have, we already, you know, know how much time more or less for a normal project they would need. So we, we book them. We have a specific department that's just focused on booking talents because it's such a, uh, it takes a lot of time and uh, there's a lot of, you know, I can be there, give me, uh, I need to be 10 minutes late, uh, uh, can it be tomorrow, stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, we have uh, a couple people just uh, devoted to that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, you get your schedule and then it's uh, where bad news come because then you're going to say, okay, a client, you needed this next week or in five days. But you know what? Your main character is out on holidays. Right. Yeah. You have two options. You either wait or you uh, look for a sound-alike voice. If it's, if it's extremely urgent, depending on the, on the project's uh, needs, you, would, might be, you may be need to uh, record a small batch with a, a voice that sounds very, very, very much alike the original or, or the or the talent you used but that's always um something that's uh, everyone tries to avoid as much as possible so that's just for an urgent uh situation a very very critical situation uh so that yeah the then because we're working with people as as in rather uh, in comparison with uh, text localization where you're working with text and words uh, at some stage on audio localization, you start working with people. And people, you know... Uh, are people. 
you know, people are people and people might fail. People, some are better, some are good, some are bad. And some are super professional, others are not maybe so much professionals. Uh, so that's one of the biggest parts of uh, handling an audio localization project. I would say it's just making sure the client is always aware of the situation of the project and say, okay, uh, you'll have these characters by next week and you're going to have the main character who is out uh, in 10 days or in 12 days, how does that work for you? And they, they, they will, you know, complain and they will say, oh, yeah, what, you know, what's up? Uh, maybe we knew, maybe we didn't know. Uh, maybe he left on holiday, maybe he's sick or she had a child, so she would be off, uh, you know. So there's a lot of situations that start to play a role in the uh, development of the localization project. And that can get very, very uh, hairy, I would say, uh, very complicated because it's a lot of people. Maybe you're dealing with a triple A game and you're dealing with, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 talents for a game, each with their own schedules, uh, problems, lives. And, you know, so you're going to it's it's um, lots of things happen. Lots of things happen there. But then. Uh, if you have your schedule and everything goes right, then you'll be able to record stuff. Then it, it will go to the audio engineers, audio engineers who would, uh, you know, maybe cut the files and start editing the files. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I should have paused because, um, I'm so curious about like, let's say, let's say, you know, like games usually get into their crunch mode. I'm not sure, like if 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 at like the last final stages of the game development, there's still some some new audio that might show up. But what if you know? Because you 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 were talking about like constraints within the audio localization, but you have the bigger constraint, which is like the release of the game, right? Like the must you need to hit. So what happens if then like you get like a smaller new audio updates, and the voice talent is like off, like away, like you cannot get hold of them and they recorded like 95 percent of the 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 audio before yeah that's that's just one of the problems you can face that maybe uh you've recorded some stuff uh some cinematic in some way but then they changed a bit mm -hmm. the original and then you just record that single spot they they changed but then the flow when you see it, it entirely the flow breaks so it doesn't work so those are the things you have to be mindful of when receiving changes by the client. So how much does this affect what we've already recorded? Uh, and keeping track of what you've already recorded and, and what's uh, yet to be recorded and, and, and how everything kind of works together is also a very complicated part of being an audio PM. And how much are games changed uh, during the development process i would say a lot so whenever <laughs> yeah too much i'd say whenever uh, you always have the like a couple of big big constraints which are submission date and uh you know the, the release date but uh, of course everything that goes beyond submission is already going to be in a day one day zero patch so and maybe people don't know this, but that's why you're seeing uh, such a big uh, day zero, day one patches these days, because most of them have a lot of audio in them. So it's not development. It's audio that's in them. Maybe it's localized audio. So because the, uh, as I was saying, the, uh, the, the localization kind of goes last in the development process. So every change that's done already in the final stages of development is going to be super late for organization. And so I would bet a lot of money that uh, all those day zero patches, all those giant day zero patches, a lot of them have to do with audio localization, like a lot of them. Maybe some bugs, maybe some, uh, you know, QA that, that, that hasn't been, uh, has been just worked around in the last days, but I would say audio organization takes a big space of that. I've seen games for which we were recording stuff on the very day of release. I've, I've had that. So, yeah. And that, that was a very, very, very critical 
yeah, stressful and critical. But I mean, in a way, you were already so late that, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's already going to go to a patch whenever it's ready. Uh, it's already going to go in a patch. So uh, at that point, you're even kind of relieved because you're already late. So doesn't it happen to you that where you know you're already going to be super late for for some somewhere? You just start taking your time. So if I maybe have a, a meeting at well, not a meeting, but I've I've, I've spoken with friends to hang up uh, hang out at seven. And I wake up at, uh, you know, 15 minutes earlier from a power nap uh, and I still have to shower and all that. It's like, okay, I'm going to be late. I'm not going to stress about it. Like, I'm going to be already so late that it doesn't even matter. So it's a matter of being 30 minutes or 45 minutes late, but you're going to be late either way. So it kind of happens that way. When you're already so late, you're going to get pressure always from the client to deliver as fast as possible. But at some point that you have to uh if you're late you're late and that's nothing you as a as a service provider that can make i mean you're going to do everything that's in your hand to speed up the process but maybe uh for some reason as i was saying the main character is out and uh, submission day is uh, tomorrow so what are you going to do about it you either wait or you go for a sound alike if they don't want the sound alike option you have to wait. It's, there's nothing you can do. And that's the thing I was, I was talking about. When working with people, you have to be super flexible. And that's the thing that the video game industry doesn't really, uh, it's not really too flexible, I would say. Uh, we, we have very tight deadlines, uh, release dates and stuff like that. So it's, it's hard, um, you know, putting those two together. together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just on this topic, do the games always release, like all the localized versions are available at the same time as English? Or is it still possible that some languages are added like later on? Yeah, it's possible. I've seen games that uh, add maybe successful games that weren't thought that they were going to get so big. Uh, then they get super big and you, the developer really wants to uh, reach out globally. So they say, so they start doing a localization effort. And, and yeah, the, the, the game was released in one language, but then, you know, you have this patch a couple months from it, uh, a couple months later, and you add like five, six languages. Yeah, that's, uh, that happens. Mm -hmm. So you started talking about the audio engineers. And actually, I was thinking, like, are they a possible solution to fixing the last minute changes? Like, can they stitch some pieces together or is it always like super unnatural? As always, it depends. You can try. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, it works perfectly. How able you are to do those types of things also depends on if you're able to find specific words uh, maybe uh, this word was badly recorded by the talent because he, uh, they recorded the thousand files that day. So one of them was incorrect. So maybe it depends on if you, how able you are to find that same word in the entire script, rescue the old file and, and try and see if it uh, fits. And if it fits, okay, you don't have to call him back. That's a saving you've made. Uh, for you and for the client, you save money for both of you. But then again, maybe you're not going to be able to. So that's when the, you have to record a, a bug session, which is also uh, quite complex to track because then uh, the way you work is by batches, uh, batch one, batch two, session one, session two, whatever the names are. So, But then it, maybe you've recorded four sessions and then LQA comes in and they start uh, doing their testing. And then by the time you're doing session five, you're already doing session five and bug fixing of sessions one to four. Mm -hmm. So then you're starting to branch out. You're having different scripts. Uh, you're having different uh, assets and you have to create your own bug fixing script on your own. And the way bug fixing works is that they will just send you their reports, the LQA uh, sends, 
and you have to figure them out. So maybe rescue the file, maybe the file name has changed uh, from the moment you recorded it to the moment they got to OQA. Uh, some development thing happened there and they changed the entire set of files. So you can like, why am I not aware of recording this file? Because this file wasn't recorded by that name, it was recorded by this other name. So bug fixing is another whole damn world. Uh, I'd say it, it's it take it's uh, the I would say you know uh, taking care of uh, people you know uh, scheduling and bug fixing are the most complex of it all. Mm -hmm. That's super hard, and and you have to keep a super tight control of everything, or you're gonna fail miserably. Because by the time you're doing bug fixing, game is already uh, in crunch mode probably. So they're going to be sending out stuff, changes, I don't know, if every day, uh, things get messy, and, and you can end up recording a, a bad patch with uh, an out-of-date uh, translation, stuff like that. So you need to be aware of that and then do the work before it gets, uh, it gets to be too complex. So you have to have everything retracted. Even if a were if a if a sentence was changed during the recording process, you have to have what those what the talent really said, not what not what was in the script, but what they really said. So if a if a a bug comes and says, "Hey, the talent is saying this when he should be saying this other thing," then you go to the fire and say, "Why is he saying this?" Okay, and then you can see the change. Or maybe you're saying, okay, maybe I sent an old version of the file. That's what they are not, they are flagging this as a bug, but it's just not because the file was wrongly recorded, because I sent the old file rather than the bug fixed file. So, yeah, lots of tracking to do there and very, very micromanagement. Speaking of bugs, when does the QA happen? Uh, okay, so we, we left the process kind of in the, the um, sound engineers would those guys would cut uh, edit the files maybe and it depends on the studio they would have uh, renaming tools so each file is uh, the has the name the client wants it to have mm -hmm. and then on our case uh, it goes uh, through qa so it, it all those files get listened to by our our internal qa teams mm -hmm. and they would uh, see if everything makes sense, if there's a mispronunciation or if there's a, a bug we can detect before sending it to the client, stuff like that. So, yeah, we have an, uh, a QA internal department uh, that would receive the files from the sound engineers and they would just check them out, listen to them all, type uh, any changes that have been made to the file. So that's that's where you get the actual transcription of what was recorded, mm -hmm. and then those guys, if everything's okay, then those are the guys that would send me as a PM, like say, hey, this batch is ready, so you can send it to the client, and after that, you as a PM, maybe you're gonna have to recreate a folder structure. So it depends on on how the client wants the files, but maybe they want it on a per character basis. So you want to have uh, Soldier 1, and although all Soldier 1 files inside that folder, but maybe uh, you can have uh, multiplayer, uh, then inside the multiplayer folder, you're going to have a, a folder per uh, action. Uh, so toss, attack, defend, whatever, or maybe a folder by map depend of for the campaign so you're gonna have to rebuild that uh, structure uh, again or maybe just build it from from the ground up we have tools also to kind of uh, ease that process huh? because we're talking about thousands of files putting all, all those files in, in specific folders and if also good then you check uh, the files you kind of uh, do your final checks everything's there all names are there uh, it's looking good you put it in a nice uh, package and you send it to the client in a, through a secure platform. Right, right, right. Okay. So that would be kind of the entire process from start to finish. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Now we know everything. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it gets it gets messy, super messy at some points. But uh, now now you inspired the people to start competitors to keywords. <laughs> it's a generic process, right? I would assume it's just like a high level. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's just how things go. All studios might have their own tools and stuff like that, but. Uh, the process is more or less uh, standard. You know what? One thing that I was thinking about when we we're talking about how we could fix the, the 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 audio issues. I'm not sure how it's called officially, but is it like voice synthesis? Like where the computer can actually generate a voice based on like some sample. Mm -hmm. So our technology is not there yet. So we. We keep investigating and we keep uh, seeing how the industry develops. But the technology, and for anyone, uh, it's not there yet. So maybe, maybe in a very long future, it could help. Uh, in a very far future, it could help with some stuff. But our idea is that technology is always uh, a tool, but it re never really replaces anything so you're always going to have the the human aspect uh safeguarding quality because machines can make a lot of mistakes it's kind of the same i would say as if you do machine translation uh, then you're always going to have to post edit the files or, or the um the batches or the translations so to the text to speech could not convey emotions, could not convey uh, or not properly. So technology is not there. It's not something we kind of uh, give it too much thought as of now. We are always on the lookout and we're always, we always have our own, you know, developments in place, you, you know, trying to see what technology goes and all that. But uh, it's just experiments for now. Yeah, it's good that you brought up the example of machine translation. Because yes, you need post editing, but not in all cases. And that's actually where, where the budget comes in because some companies for some smaller niche markets, they may want to opt just to have machine translation because they don't want to pay for the post editing. So I'm thinking, is this something like that could be happening for games or is it already happening? Like maybe for some like very small markets, the players would actually be okay just getting something that's generated by a computer and it's not super top-notch or it would damage the the game totally this is this is a personal opinion i see games as a form of narr narration mm. uh, it's a very complex type of narration i would say again it could maybe help you out in some specific cases but it's not something that's viable as in you know we're going to just do machine translation right i know there are uh companies and keywords own um keywords has uh, own machine translation companies that uh, develop engines for uh, companies and other uh, services so for example they developed a, an engine for legal text translation those don't get post edited because they are good enough to just be understandable and we're talking about millions of words uh, that need to go through uh, machine translation so it kind of makes sense for that niche but for games i would say you're always going to want to uh, prioritize quality and quality uh, as as far as i understand it it all means human if you want quality you need human uh, interaction human involvement so maybe it could help somehow, but for games, I think there's such a complex and, and rich type of uh, narration that you need people. You need people on top of and you need actual experts. And that's one of the things we are always kind of thinking about. Like we work with a lot of uh, external partners, uh, translators and linguists and talents and stuff, but we always want to have expert in-house experts uh, for games. So if we're talking about a specific client, we want, to, we want the PMs in control to know all about uh, that game. So the expertise 
it, it's always on, on the center. You know, people and their expertise are always on the, on the center of how we try and make uh, achieve quality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. I think in Star Wars, you know, like the characters who have already passed away, they're, they still made their appearance in the movies. <laughs> So maybe once the technology is 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 working well, the same could happen for voice as well. You never know. I mean, uh, you can never tell how how far technology is going to get. But uh, I would say that always, always, always quality. Uh, even a hundred years from now, I would say quality means human. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And specifically, if you t- like tailor a performance or a translation. Or any type of content, which is what I think really localization is all about, is making content relevant for audiences, and that's that goes beyond translation. It's about um, emotion. It's about how people in a specific region think of uh, of you know a, a certain thing. Uh, it's how they talk. It's uh, intonation. It's a lot of things, and localization is about making content that's relevant for a specific audience relevant to other audiences so let's say if if you go on, if you want to achieve that people and expertise are always going to be in the middle of it all even if technology advances it's always going to be just a tool 